This week, we carry on with what we started last week. This is part two of our deep dive into space policy. So we're joined again by the Chief of Space Policy at the Planetary Society, Casey Dreyer. If you had $10 billion to spend on space flight, what would you spend it on? Let us know via our social media pages at Space and Things Podcast, on Threads, Instagram, and Facebook, or via the contact form on our website. And please consider joining us over at patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, it's time for episode 178 of the Space and Things podcast. Oh my God. You're listening to the Space and Things podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles. Welcome to episode 178 of our podcast. Emily and I are in Washington, D.C. at the moment. Probably, as you're listening, walking around the Air and Space Museum, which is a lot of fun. So we're going to crack on with this week's main feature straight away. While you shouldn't have to listen to last week's podcast for this one to make sense, it probably will help. So if you've not listened to that, press stop on this one, listen to that, and then come back here. Within that, we learn more about Casey's background and how he got into space policy and advocacy and got a good overview of how things happen or don't happen <laughs> with US space flight. So go on, off you go. We'll see you back here later. Go on, go on, see ya, bye. <laughs> okay, now we've got those of you who were here last week, so let's get started, uh, shall we? Dave, roll the tape of part two of our interview with Casey Dreyer. Absolutely. Past to present, Sputnik to Starship. This is Space and Things. So we're aware that there's a lot of talk about truncating the Mars sample return effort because of the expense. So why is this an issue and are there any less expensive alternatives that might be viable in that situation? Oh, uh, yes. Mars sample return. So, yes, yeah, this is the... <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a, a big meaty issue right now, right? This is the the JW, the James Webb Space Telescope of our current generation of projects. So the fundamental issue, right? We want to go to Mars. Well, right now, Perseverance is on Mars, happily and successfully collecting these incredible scientific samples. It's not just grabbing any old rocks on the surface. This is the equivalent of a geologist doing it. They do like a walk around. They do this. They study the geologic context of the area. They characterize both the atmosphere, the, the soil conditions around it. They take the sample, pristinely preserved in these little sample tubes, ready to return back to Earth. The type of science you can do with a giant Earth laboratory with your biggest, most power hungry and exquisitely developed sensitive machines is so far beyond what we can do in a miniaturized, uh, low power, very cold and and ruthless environments such as on the surface of Mars, it's it's an incredible potential scientific return. There is a reason no one has brought samples back from Mars before. It's one of those things you look at the difficulty of it, and it's it's not just the fact that you need to launch off the surface of another planet for the first time, or the fact that you're doing this all autonomously, that you're you have to dock in the orbit of another planet autonomously, launch autonomously, right? There's no tech that can run up and twist a bolt or <laughs> close off some leaking valve line, you know, on the surface of Mars for you the way that we can on that launch pad here on Earth. Or the fact that you have to come back for, for a nine month trip before landing in, in the desert. Uh, it's that you have to do all of these on the celestial time schedule set by the orbital mechanics of Earth and Mars. Of course. And so yeah. you have this profoundly rigid and unforgiving timeline, both to launch and to return to Mars, right? You can only launch every 26 months, come back on a similar schedule. You have the unforgiving nature of the surface of Mars, all the automation, everything, all this playing together, all these interfaces between the rover dropping off samples into a sample container, the sample container going into a rocket, a rocket launching into space and being collected into a container on an orbiting spacecraft. All of these is just difficult. And I just, I go through this just to emphasize, it's, <laughs> we say space is hard a lot. Mars sample return is really, really hard. <laughs> uh, again, there's a reason we haven't done it before. The original idea was that we do a, what was called a lean sample return program uh, starting in late 2010s. 
uh, with the idea that we do it for as low as $3 billion or so dollars by 2026. They had an independent review, look at the program, said, no, this isn't going to work. Uh, you'll need more. And it'll have to be 2028, probably. So they got first delay. And the decadal survey that went through in 2022 was assuming about $5 billion for this mission, which to put it in context for a planetary mission, one of my uh, hobbies at, at the Planetary Society is collecting annualized spending data for every planetary robotic mission ever made going back to the <laughs> 1960s. I know, who hasn't? That. <laughs> and yeah. the idea, that way we can say, well, how much does each spacecraft cost? A $5 billion mission would already put Mars sample return at among the top five most expensive missions in planetary science, uh, with Viking actually being the most expensive at about seven, $8 billion adjusted for inflation. We had a second independent review just come through the project. They hit a bunch of technical problems management problems, serious, serious management problems, and the actual cost now they're predicting will be upwards of 10 to $11 billion. Ooh. That's about how much the James Webb Space Telescope costs. That's about how much Hubble's cost. That's, that's roughly up there and could easily exceed the most expensive science mission ever done by NASA it from our sample return. For a science mission, that is a lot of money. For a human spaceflight mission, that's Tuesday, right? That's <laughs> it's not a, not a huge thing. But we have different standards for these different processes. Yeah. We are not yet resolved in what will happen with Mars sample return. Uh, in reaction to that budget, projected budget increase from this, this independent review board, the U.S. Senate released a budget cutting uh, annual funding for the project by two-thirds and said... Uh, if you cannot execute this program at $5 billion, consider yourself canceled. Oof. The House came back and said, no, here's a billion dollars for your mission. We are completely committed to this. We're going to do this. And NASA has said that they will take these uh, new findings into consideration and will get back to us <laughs> sometime <laughs> in March. They're taking their time. Uh, they don't know what they're going to do. And so in the meantime, in this huge uncertainty, even though none of these budgets have actually passed into law, what happens is that the White House throttles spending to the lowest of all possible likely scenarios, just in case they don't want to get caught with their pants down six months into the fiscal year and have that Senate budget pass and they were spending at a higher rate. So what it has functionally done is completely halted the entire program. They're laying off people at uh, various NASA centers who are associated with the project. It's chaos. And, and no matter what the Senate's intention was, we'll certainly increase the cost of the mission through this uncertainty and, and slow down uh, because they'll have to hire all these people back. <laughs> they'll have to fix it back up. But again, we don't even know what NASA wants to do. Um, so it's a, it's a big, 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 big problem. <laughs> Uh, it's the highest priority uh, in the Decadal survey. They were very explicitly clear about this, that this is the time to do it. So the scientific community formally has said this is the highest priority. Informally, though, it, it's a much more mixed, I think, set of opinions on the value of this program. And we're seeing that play out right now. I think there's a really fascinating distinction here. Why did James Webb, which cost about the same, also had huge budget growth, uh, went through a near cancellation in 2010, 2011, and ate a big part of the astrophysics ambitions and funding for, for decade. Why did that get through with such broad support from the community where we have not seen a similar, yet similar uh, reaction from the planetary science community from our sample return? And I think there's an interest, a fascinating function of how science is done in astronomy versus planetary science where astronomy, you're collecting photons and anyone can collect photons. Anyone can use those photons for their own science. It's a tool. You're building a broad multi-purpose platform. James Webb Space Telescope is sitting out there at a Lagrange point. You can point it at Neptune. You can point it at Uranus. You can point it at a galaxy. You can point it at stars. You can do whatever you, can, you want as long as you're collecting photons, particularly in the infrared. So a huge swath of the astrophysics community and astronomy community can use James Webb Space Telescope for maybe two decades to do whatever they can think of to make it do. Mars sample return and all of planetary science is in situ, right? In place. The science that you get from any planetary mission will be related to the planet 
that you are going to. So if you study Venus, you have very little interest in Mars missions to begin with, much less a Mars sample return mission. This doesn't say that Mars sample return won't have. It will have major implications for all of planetary science, but it's all on the back end, right? So only once you get the samples back. So you're putting an upfront investment of $10 billion and then waiting 15, 20 years for this information to get back. And then the actual community of people to study this, very, very small sample return uh, scientists, meteoriticists, very small community that then the results of that will then inform, but not directly pay for or contribute to the science of all these other scientists, right? So it's a very different style of science when you go to a planet to explore the planet versus build a, a photon collector like James Webb Space Telescope. And I think this is going to be a very interesting challenge is that can you unite a community like the planetary science community around a broad and, and big and expensive mission like Mars Sample Return that won't immediately impact or enable them to have grant funding, to hire graduate students, to, to participate in the scientific process rather than integrate its results back into their understanding of, of planetary science. Um, it's it's to be determined. <laughs> so that may be a layer of wow. detail deeper than your uh, uh, listeners are expecting. But I think that's the the fundamental. No, that's great. It's, it's a profoundly different situation than James Webb Space Telescope. And we don't, we, this has never really been tested. To me, it's like ostensibly like a feasible thing that people who are attached with the project in the beginning might not be attached with it in the end because there's mm -hmm. going to be so... You said it's going to take a while for this to come back. So it's like we're talking about, you know, people are dedicating their lifetimes to certain missions mm -hmm. when you really stretch out the time from development to when it comes back. So that that to me is is kind of neat to point out that, you know, these are people's entire mm -hmm. careers and just crazy. The, the other observation there is if it's going to take this long and that much money and we know that there is albeit small, but there is political will to send humans to Mars anyway in the next 20 years. Long shot, I know, but there is some talk about that. Why spend planetary science money on Mars as well when that money could be used on Venus where we're not sending humans or to Neptune, so on and so forth. I, 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 don't, I don't think we need a comment from that, but that's just, as you talk about it then, that's how my brain starts thinking about it. It's like, yeah, Mars sample return sounds great when you just say it out loud. Oh yeah, it'd be great to get some samples from Mars. But at that cost, when we know money's f very much finite in this case, it doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. as you've just pointed out, all the, all the different aspects of it. If you don't mind, that's worth following up on a little bit, because I think it's a really natural and frequently asked question. And I think it's, it bears a little bit of discussion. You'll forgive me because my head is in Mars sample return right now. <laughs> this has been consuming a lot of our, our work. Um, and I think there, there's, there's two real ways to look at that. Uh, one is how seriously you think humans can get to Mars in the next 20 years. And I think that's still a, mm -hmm. we're looking at the moon as a reminder for how difficult this all is to mm -hmm. not just get humans, but even land. We saw with the Peregrine, we're recording this right after the failure of the astrobotic Peregrine lander. And just to get to the moon, much less land on it with robotics, who's, I mean, also, uh, that was it, her, uh, the Japanese company recently failed landing on the moon, Parachute failed landing on the moon. Yeah, uh, The uh, Indian Space Research Organization just succeeded after a failure. Just to land on the moon is tough. So can we get humans to Mars in 20 years? You know, I don't know. I mean, even with the uh, Starship and all that X factor, I mean, building Starship is the easiest part of getting humans to <laughs> yeah. to Mars, right? It, yep. I don't know if we can get there in twenty years. So I, I'd say it really depends on your confidence in that. And then, would humans land at the same place where we have samples? Uh, would the samples where humans land, by definition, they'll land at the safest, most boring geologically, un, you know, part of of Mars? Yeah. Very. Uh, you can grab samples and bring them back. They'll be useful, but will they be this, you know, the landing site from our Perseverance rover was carefully selected with return in mind. And it is at a, a big ancient river delta that is known to collect river deltas are concentration points for organics. It spans billions of years. There's an exposed surface crater. There's all these fundamental scientific questions of Mars to be answered specifically by going to a place like Jezero Crater. Will humans land at a similar point? Hard, almost impossible to say at this point. 
probably won't be the primary consideration. So there's all these details of it. And and actually, at the end of the day, the doing it with a robot first is probably you want to practice taking off from the surface of Mars before you commit humans to that process. You want to understand what the dust environment does to your machinery and your components and how can you launch a rocket after it sits in its own cold storage for three years to get there and, and land and, and back. So there's all these questions that help inform human spaceflight actually by doing Mars sample return. That doesn't necessarily say tip the scales one way or another. I think depending on your attitudes of how you kind of qualify these risks and analyses and likelihoods of things. But there is still a good argument for doing it now in order to inform human spaceflight, in order to get the maximum scientific value. And and that's the big, I think that's what we're, the whole community is grappling with right now. Well, now I've completely changed my mind. <laughs> that's and that's the whole point, isn't it? Like the, these conversations and the, the, they're, they're complex and, and, and they go all over the place. Yep. So there is a, obviously, there is a presidential election in the United States this year. So in general, how do new administrations, administrations and political players affect space programs? I know this is a huge question, so feel free to dumb it down. <laughs> There's a distinction between this election, which regardless of who wins, will in a sense be a second term um, right. yes, in this particular election. So we won't actually have necessarily a new administration in the classic sense. Uh, we'll have a continuation of one administration or another. But in general, to the actual content of your question, new administration. So when you have a new administration coming in, particularly taking over after a different party was in power, you have a whole transition process that's actually formalized into law and about handing over the reins of power to your successor uh, from the White House. And part of that, you have these, what they call them landing teams. The incoming administration will put together a group of professionals to go in and embed themselves in every federal administration to say what's going on. Lift, you know, they kind of lift the hood, poke around, check the oil. Are there any major problems with the programs that are going forward? What initiatives are you running? Are these going to be compatible with the political uh, interests and priorities of the incoming administration? Uh, these transition teams write up these reports. They often feed into and recommend who to nominate to run, in this case, NASA, the, who the NASA administrator should be. The president gets to nominate well, the, NASA has four positions that are Senate approved, nominated by the president, the CFO, the inspector general, the deputy administrator and the administrator. But the, the president also gets to appoint dozens, if not hundreds of uh, staff into NASA, embedding it throughout its bureaucracy to help manage and run the organization that aren't Senate approved. And so you have a big changeover of personnel related to uh, the incoming administration. So there's usually a bit of disruption regardless uh, when administrations change hands. And then usually you have, you know, what new initiatives does this incoming administration with what its priorities were, what they were elected on, what mandate they, they feel they have from the public, how do those get embedded into what NASA does? And then you'll see that reflected in this budget process, starting with the president's budget request, usually the year after an administration takes power, just because he's takes so long to put together. Sometimes they'll cancel projects. Sometimes they'll redirect funding for, sometimes they'll lower priorities or increase priorities. What's been interesting right now, and I think is distinct, the transition from the Trump administration to the Biden administration was a, a, a significant amount of consistency, more than usual, particularly with Artemis, where Artemis was the first human kind of exploration program beyond Earth orbit that had survived a presidential transition since Lyndon Johnson turned over the reins to Richard Nixon in 1969. That's pretty extraordinary. And, wow. and, and I don't, you know, I think we, we can emphasize that enough that this was an extraordinary transition that Artemis basically survived intact. And I think probably would continue if we have a change in administration coming up. The science and other questions, that becomes much harder to predict based on I think the the character of who the NASA administrator would be, uh, and also the relative power dynamics in Congress. And in a sense, we have a pretty good idea of the space policy. Well, actually, I was going to say, I was going to say we had a pretty good idea of the Trump space policy. We don't because Mike Pence is not going to be there. And he was really the driver of space policy in the Trump administration. 
he loved space, committed a lot of his energies and focus on it and, and elevated it within government. I don't know who the vice president would be in that case. And, and that's her then therefore a little bit harder to predict. So there is a process. Uh, I think in general, Artemis is pretty secure. The rest of it, though, uh, it's very hard to say. It's really quite crazy when you start looking at it from an outsider perspective, um, how anything happens at all. Because every four <laughs> years it gets thrown in the yeah, air. It, let's see where it Again, lands. democracy is not efficient. It's not no. designed to be. And I think that. <laughs> And I keep, you know, I'll I'll go off on this for one minute because this is a soapbox that I like to go off on, which is so we have expectations for efficiency that tend to come from the business world or even like a company like SpaceX has a great contrast where you have a very efficient, highly focused, incredibly effective organization that can is can do that because it's not a democratic organization right it's not even a publicly held uh, not a publicly traded company yeah it is a privately held company under the fiefdom of one one person who's acts as you know basically total control over the company however he wants to do it they can lay off who they want they can set up they can <laughs> cancel they can do things whatever they want they don't have congress breathing down their neck so by virtue of its lack of democratic structures it is able to be efficient but nasa is organization that answers to our democratic uh, system and democratically elected representatives, whoever they may be. And that inefficiency is baked into the system that is designed to have inputs from lots of people. It is designed to have a variety of coalitions required to enable anything. It is, it, And it can be frustrating as a fan of space to see that. But as a fan of democracy, I'm quite positive. <laughs> I'm quite keen on that aspect of it. But it's not democracies are not efficient systems by design because you cannot have efficient systems that take into account large numbers of, of input from a variety of stakeholders. And that is just, I, th I think what we're starting to see is again, this is interesting. And frankly, I think there's a philosophically, I'm, I'm very ambivalent uh, on this move towards de-democratizing aspects of our space program in order to make them more efficient. So we're, we're, we're saving money, but we, we're losing oversight and control over the, the system itself. And that has advantages, clearly. Um, but also there may be something more fundamental that we're losing as a consequence of that. And it's an interesting mix that we're creating this hybrid system now where we still have this. It's amazing anything works at all. I agree. <laughs> like all things considered... A colleague of mine who worked in the American Association for the Advancement of Science, who looked at the broader scientific portfolio, every year the United States spends, and I just rough numbers here, around 65 to $70 billion on fundamental science. That, that's not uh, military science. It's not uh, Department of Defense. It's just pure it's like Department of Energy, NASA, the National Science Foundation, um, NOAA, all these kind of scientific organizations. All these scientific organizations are spread around through a dozen, half a dozen different federal agencies under a half a dozen different subcommittees of Congress. And every year they're funded really consistently, really consistently. You know, the small growth every year, about 60-ish billion and growing. He called it the annual miracle that every year would be so consistent. Still, somehow spread out through so many different people, so many different committees, so many different interest groups, so many different parts of the country. And it, there's something to it. Like once you get these systems going and, you know, we can complain about the special interest groups that are part of them or people, you know, vying for their own interests. And at the end of the day, though, it's it's a very reliable and powerful system we've created for all of its faults. Um, and sometimes that means we spend more money than we could in an ideal case if an authoritarian was running it the exact way that we would want it to be run. Or that sometimes we'll have to re-litigate arguments we feel we've already made or have to convince a new group of people every two years that this is worth doing. That's the price of doing business in a, in a democracy. Um, and that's something that's, again, this is why there are people like me and why we have organizations like the Planetary Society is to because you have to constantly make the case uh, over and over and over and over again, even if you think it should be obvious, <laughs> an obvious outcome. So there's my little pitch for the democratic and efficient systems. 
Yeah, I loved that. You just opened a whole can of worms, which I thought was absolutely wonderful. There was a point there I was like, oh my God, he's just blown my mind. My existentialist crisis yeah. has now started. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, on, a, on a brief follow-up on that, very brief follow-up, I've read many books about the history of NASA and how it's all worked, and the NASA administrator job seems to me the craziest of them all because in some instances that person has wielded incredible power and other times have been incredibly passive or it comes across that they may have mm -hmm. been incredibly passive or maybe not as efficient at getting things done as, as others. When we have these new administrations or at any time, even, even at the end of a four-year cycle when someone gets re-elected and they may want to reappoint someone new, how much upheaval is just that one role? How many headaches does that cause NASA? <laughs> That's true. It's, it really can depend on the person. It is very personality dependent. I th it's significant, right? It's your, the administrator of NASA, as you point out, has, can have incredible influence and power to a degree, but it really depends on their politicking and, and networking abilities too. They have to be an excellent convincer. As, as a federal agency, you're you're not just bound by what Congress tells you to do by law, right? Congress will tell you to do things. You're bound by this huge, sprawling federal contracting law and other, pol like there's the NASA policy database that anyone can view. And it's, I don't know, 25,000 pages. It, there's all of these federal processes in place, but, you know, that you have to, in order to do things a certain way, you have to adhere to these very detailed set of things to do. There's a spin-up time where an administrator has to learn the ropes, know what's happening in their own agency, and know who is responsible for what. You have uh, center heads of NASA, various centers with their own agendas who will try to manage those and manage them and influence the administrator. Yeah, it, I mean, just the, the changeover in the person. And it's not just them, it's the deputy administrator. Uh, even the CFO. This is why you have the role of associate administrator, which is actually the highest placed civil servant who does persist right. through administrations, meant to be some sort of leadership level C-suite civil servant staff to maintain workforce knowledge and, and familiarity and so forth. But yeah, just changing administrators. And it's been really fascinating actually over the years. We've shifted from administrators who were scientists and for a while astronauts and now we're seeing administrators who were former members of Congress. And I actually think that's probably a for the better <laughs> because what yeah. are they doing? They're going to Congress asking for money and support. You might as well have a good politician doing that, someone who respects the science and the motivation of NASA, which we, which we have for the two that we've had. But I think comes with a built-in familiarity of the systems in which they will be operating. An astronaut has to learn that uh, on the fly. And we've seen some of the more disappointing, I think, outcomes of certain administrations from when astronauts were leading NASA than with politicians. Is there any way regular people who might just like spaceflight, might be spaceflight enthusiasts, can they ma make their voices known to people who decide spaceflight budgets? Uh, well, I'm glad you asked that. And yes, absolutely. This is a, a huge part of my job is trying to empower people uh, to take action and to participate in this crazy, messy, frustrating, slow democratic system that we have. Uh, and that's one of the big things that we do at the Planetary Society, my organization. We ultimately answer to our members and anyone can be a member, but you don't have to be a member to to take political action with us. You can go to planetary.org slash advocacy or planetary.org slash action center. Uh, and you can see we have always have a number of ways that you can email your members of Congress if you live in the United States to talk about some of our top priorities right now. Um, we try to keep those very current and they will adapt and change depending on what time of the year it is and, and what's the most valuable thing to do. We have an online course uh, on our membership, uh, on our online membership community called Space Advocacy 101 that goes through what I just said in more detail and teaches you how to read NASA's presidential budgets, how to understand tips to communicate with Congress really effectively. That's free. You just have to be a member, um, which again starts at four bucks a month. And then we also, every year, uh, have been doing our in-person congressional visits. We call it the Day of Action. This year, we will be going to Washington, D.C. on April 29th, 28th and 29th of 2024. And if you sign up for this, uh, it's at planetary.org slash day of action. 
We will book meetings with you and your representatives in Congress. Uh, you will have opportunities to meet them and their staff face to face. We will give you training. We will give you, you'll be part of a team of other Planetary Society members. Uh, we'll give you talking points. We'll we'll make you the best advocate you can be. Anyone, even if you've never even thought about doing this before, you can join us. We, so we, cool. Anyone of any level is able to do it. If you have a U.S. address, you're, you're able to do it. And if you're 18 or if you're under 18, just bring your parents. And, and we've had we've had twelve year olds be some of the most effective advocates to go into some Amazing. of these congressional offices, and that's something we take. It's a big project for us, and we try to make it as easy and as fun uh, for it uh, as we can. And it's a really cool day to do it. And that's uh, planetary.org/dayofaction if you're interested. But yeah, a number of opportunities, and there's other organizations that'll help you with this too. But I'm obviously, pretty a big fan of what we do at the Planetary Society to to try to help mediate those engagements. You know, there's an old saying in Washington, D.C. that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so, you know, we, our job is to be at the table and to help you continue and engage with your representatives. And it doesn't always work. It doesn't always uh, pay off immediately, but sometimes it does. And if, you know, the one thing is like, if you don't do it, someone else will. Uh, and you have no idea what they're saying <laughs> about space. They may hate it. They may not like it. They have some yeah. cockamamie idea. Um, so it's a great opportunity to to try uh, making that voice part of that conversation. Yeah. Decisions are made by those who turn up, I believe, it's is true. the quote from uh, the West Wing. Democracy is not a spectator sport. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yep. so I, I've loved every moment of this. Thank you so much, Casey. This has been wonderful. Absolutely magnificent. Thank you for your time and for all these answers yes. and, and highlighting so many things for our listeners. We really appreciate it. Oh, uh, my pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking. Me. Bringing you a new episode every Thursday since September 2020. This is Space and Things. Okay, so much to unpack there, but let's start with the Mars sample return stuff. The reports about the budget rises and questions about whether it will still happen were the reason we wanted to have a space policy episode in the first place. So it was great to get Casey's thoughts on this, and he went in deep, really more than I was expecting, with his explanation of the complexities of that mission and why it's so hard. I don't know about you, I changed my mind two or three times with whether we should bother to do it while he was talking. And that's that's just from listening to what I think is probably a basic version of what is happening. I'm certain he would have dumbed it down for us. At the end of the day, if we want to learn about Mars and its history, we're going to need a lot of samples from a lot of different areas on Mars. Exactly. So I guess it just boils down to what we think is yeah. important. It really drives down the fact that, you know, Mars is is largely unexplored. I think people yeah. think, oh, we've sent spacecraft there, so, you know, we've explored it. We've solved the problem of Mars exploration. We have not. Uh, really, there have been very few spacecraft that have made it to Mars. Obviously, there have been a lot sent to Mars. Not everybody has, not every spacecraft has survived. So there's still just a lot we don't know about the Mars environment. And really, the idea of getting a sample from Mars, launching it from the surface of Mars, I mean, that in itself is going to be a challenge yeah. because it's never, to my knowledge, never been done, never been done before. They're going to have to invent novel technologies to to do this. That's probably also, you know, a thing that just dry, keeps driving up the cost because these are new things that just have not been done before. You can test them on Earth, but it's not going to be exactly like uh, the conditions that it's going to actually work under. Yeah, I mean, Casey said something in that interview, which I'd never thought of before, which is that for this to work, a rocket has to travel all that distance and time to Mars without anyone being able to fix anything or adjust anything like that physically may have need tweaking and work. And of course, for a program which is going to be so expensive... It has a lot of failure points and a high probability of failure. And that's something I hadn't really thought about too much. I think we've seen, you know, um, this is this may be a bad example, but we've seen um, Ingenuity, which has been wildly successful. The, the Mars helicopter that flew um, with Perseverance. And we've seen how, you know, that had a very short predicted lifespan. You know, they thought it was going to fly a little bit, you know, blah, 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 whatever. 
it's still going. You know, I mean, they're still flying that thing and they're still learning a lot from it. They're figuring out that, you know, how do we use these novel technologies on on another world? There's going to be a lot of that for a Mars sample return mission. You know, these are things that simply have not been done yet. You know, that's probably a lot of what's driving up the cost. But it's fascinating to hear Casey kind of break it down for us in a way that is understandable. There's that part of me that's like, man, let's just do it. You know, let's just do it. <laughs> yeah. Why? So what? It's expensive. It's just money. It's just money, right? And then it's like when you really break it down, the reason why it takes up so many resources is just because it's very novel and it's still something that's developing. It is fascinating to see how this is developing. And it's exciting to talk about it just because there's that part of me that kind of is like, it would be cool to see that in our lifetime. But that, who knows, we may not see it. Yeah, well, let, let's keep our fingers crossed. And of, of course, the other aspect of this week's interview was learning about how elections change everything for NASA. We Last week, obviously, we learned about how the budgets get put together I don't think we factored in the change in personnel that can also happen every four years. And as Emily, you pointed out in the interview, will be potentially happening again later this year. You know, people spend a huge amount of time moaning about NASA's inefficiencies and how long things take and delays to programs that we want to see now. I've been very guilty of that in the past too, and in the not so distant past as well. But when it gets pointed out to you how it actually works, it really is surprising, as I said in the interview, that anything gets done. But as Casey pointed out, it's it's the price we pay for democracy. Maybe we should be more patient with the system because ultimately it could be better for us all if we allow democracies to run the space agenda rather than CEOs and dictators. Hmm. Anyway, the work that Casey is doing at the Planetary Society and the work the whole society does really is amazing. And I am really proud to call myself a member of that society. I'm embarrassed to admit this. I am not a member of the Planetary Society, but I need to sign up for it. Um, I, I need to sign it's up for it. It's a free t-shirt. Yes. It's a free t-shirt. Need, yes. I, yeah, I'm already sold. I'm already sold. I want to do it. But um, <laughs> I love my Seriously, one. though, like uh, I think space advocacy in any form is very important. For me, I think the next step would be to contact people in, in the political arena because they need people to who know, I'd like to think I know a little bit of what I'm talking about, but they need to hear it from people who have some involvement or some passion about it. And I, I think that's very important. Plus, it's your civic duty, I think, as well to, to get involved with these issues. And maybe that's the next step. Who knows? On top of all the other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... I think we all should be more involved with our own democracies and how space policy is decided. Anyway, as always, all the information about Casey and the Planetary Society can be found in this week's show notes. Head over to spacethingspodcast.com or click on the link in the description of this episode in your podcast provider. To find out what guests are coming up in the future and submit your questions, head over to patreon.com forward slash space and things. Okay. That's it for this week. So hopefully next week, Emmy, over the next few weeks, hopefully we'll have some wonderful things to share, you, share with you from our trip to Washington, D.C. Thank you to all of you who continue to support what we do, whether it's hitting the share button, buying some merchandise, or the all-important ones, signing <laughs> up to Patreon and helping to power what we do. Thank you. So head over to spaceandthingspodcast.com if you would like to check out our new merchandise or sign up to Patreon at patreon.com forward slash space and things. Yes. Uh, thank you all so much. I'm looking forward to sharing uh, what we were up to in Washington with all of you. But don't forget, in space, no one can hear you meet.